Okay, so, so today we'll start the material for exam number three. And if you'll tur turn to your syllabus. Uh, let's take a look at this. Um, I just mentioned the exams have been posted, and those exams are reviewable upstairs in the office. Um, pretty much during the office hours of my secretary from about 8 in the morning to about 4 in the afternoon. And uh, she has a key, and you can do that for the next couple of weeks and look over that exam. I really do encourage it. I think on the last exam, only six people went by to look. Only six people, you know, went to buy to look at their exam. So please, it's a really important thing to do. And um, let me know if you need help getting to that uh, exam to review that. I think it's important. Um, on the next, if you look at the syllabus, you see that exam three is really not that far away. It's a week from Thursday. Okay, it's not that far away. Now, that exam is going to cover just three presentations. Today's presentation will be on a skeletal system, on bones. You've already heard most of this story, to be honest, in lab. So I'll be adding to what you already know and adding a few details, but you've already heard most of it. On Thursday, I'll be discussing joints. And in lab tonight or already this week, you've already heard some of this story. And then next Tuesday, I'll be describing muscle. And that's all that's on this exam, bones and muscles and joints. It's three presentations. And while you're getting ready for this exam, you also have the lab exam that's kind of in the background and is coming up pretty soon, and that lab exam is largely also muscles and bones. So it kind of all comes together um, within a few days of each other. The, the, the third exam, bones and muscles, and the lab exam, which has a lot of bones and muscles on it. The lab exam is on the 14th, right? It depends on what night you're on. So Tuesday night will be on the 14th, that sounds right, right? Yeah. And uh, Thursday night would be, I think, before that. Um, he had said that because like us that have lecture on Thursday, mm -hmm. we will have our exam too and our lab practice on the Sounds same Sounds right, day. yep. Um, he said that he was going to talk to you about like trying to have us, because he doesn't, he doesn't recommend us to take our exam. Usually the students who take them on the same night do better than those who don't, really? because you're studying for the same material. It's bones and muscles. Now, it's your, if he wants to work something out, that's a possibility, but the exam will be on Thursday. Okay. Okay. So what he, just, he, what he wants to work out with you for those students who want to go to a different lab, but we only have limited space. And honestly, I have found students who do just fine because it's the same stuff. Okay. Question? Um, your email earlier, you said you had 114 of that. I did. So there were 114 available points on the exam. I counted it out of 100. So everyone could miss the first 14 questions, and it didn't hurt them at all. So our grade that we have right now is with 14? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So the grade width is, is including the 14-point bump. Yep. Um, is this vocab going to be on our exam notes? We're yes, exam notes. three. Exam three will be 37 through 52. Are my numbers right? Look at the syllabus. I think that's right. 37 through 52 will be on exam number three next week. And I'll go through some of those with you now, and then we'll continue with that. Again, vocabulary was a mixed bag this time. Uh, second exam, first exam went pretty well on vocab. This one, there were some people who just did not know their vocab. I mean, it was like they were giving me random words. It was, it was like, I don't know, very random. So make sure you're using, I still think the best way to do vocab is note cards and flashcards. And um, I, I think making them up now and flashing through them once a day should be sufficient. And then when the time comes for the exam, you're not stressing about vocabulary. And you'll get those 10 or, 10 or 12 points with no problem. Uh, vocabulary on the next exam. Yes. Okay, so question about online resources. Thank you for that reminder. I just loaded them this afternoon. You will see, or you will see by the end of the day, uh, homework for chapters um, 6 and 7, which is skeletal, 8 for joints, and I may be off by numbers, but there's three homework assignments on there right now, okay? One is for muscles, one is for joints, one is for bones. And then there's a copy of the homework. If you want to do them a second time, you can do that. You only have to do it the first time. I did not yet load the learning modules. I wanted to ask you, how many of you did the learning modules and thought they were useful? Useful? Good. I'll put them on there. I'll put them on there uh, tonight. Okay, so they'll be there. Those are completely optional. There will still be a quiz that will help you get prepared for this exam. Now, 16 people took a zero on that last quiz. 16 people did not do the lecture quiz on mastering. And guess what students did very, very poorly on the exam? The same 16 students. 
So I've got a group of students who simply are not engaged. They're not doing the online resources. I got it to go. Yeah, there's a reason why. Good. It's We're recording right now. Tell me later. Well, I can't. So what was I saying? Oh, mastering. Okay, so a lot of people didn't do the quiz. And because they didn't do the quiz, they weren't as prepared for the exam as they should have been. Finally, um, there will be on this set of assignments, you will see a quiz that says PAL quiz. It is a quiz meant to get you ready, not for the lecture exam, but for the lab exam. So it's on mastering, and it's there, and you should take it before you take your lab exam. The deadline for that is going to be way out, right? If you're in uh, Tuesday night lab, sorry, if you're in Thursday night lab, you're going to see the deadline way out on Tuesday, right? But you really should take that quiz on PAL before you take the lecture exam because it's going to prepare you for the lecture, for the lab exam. Sorry. Take it before the lab exam. Okay? Question? Um, with mine and my mastering, I tried to plug into that, and then I tried to go on to the site and do my quiz, and it wouldn't let me on. It would load the same page every time. And I moved, I'd like shut down my computer and reload it again. Okay. Have I received an email saying there was a problem? Okay, so if I don't receive an email, I can't help you with your problem. Okay, so send me an email. Okay, let me know what's going on. Um, also, there's a help site right on there. Now, I will agree. Now, I got an email. I'll tell you right this. I got an email, and I think this is part of it, from MCC saying that they're going to have to do an update on Pearson connection in the next day or so, and that there may be 25 minutes, and I don't know if it's going to be between today and tomorrow, where mastering won't be available to us, and they're upgrading something. And I think this might be part of it, because when I click on my mastering button, I have to click on it a couple of times, and sometimes it kicks me out, and then I do it again, and it lets me in. And there's a bug there that they're solving, okay? But I always get in. I just have to sometimes two, try two or three times. So just uh, if you're having issues, though, especially after tomorrow, this is supposed to be fixed by tomorrow. So at some point, we're going to crash for 25 minutes on Pearson, and then it'll be back. And hopefully that's the bug they're fixing. So I recognize that it happens, but I've always been able to get in if I try a couple more times. Other questions? Um, on the quiz, is there any way that you can make it available after you have finished? I'm working on that. I'm working on that. Okay. Wait, okay, after I take the quiz, is there a way that you can go in and see what you got? That's what you just asked. Oh, okay. Next. Sometimes with the mastering, you can't get into it. I found that it's the browser that you use. Yeah, so switch. which browser have you been more seeing? I, I know I like Firefox. Yeah, I use Safari or Firefox? Yeah, sometimes I think there's an issue there. And again, there is a, when you're in Pearson, when you're in Mastering, there's a button that says um, um, something about browse my computer to make sure you have all the, you're using the most updated browsers and things. And so that's a really good thing to check every once in a while because uh, these are all free uploads. Something that your computer may have an outdated version of Firefox or an outdated version of IE, and it will direct you to where to go to get the more updated one. And sometimes those little buggy things can be worked out by making sure you have the most up-to-date uh, browsers. Will we have a copy of the homework again? Yes, I've already said that. Yep, the copy is there. It's optional. Yep, the copy is there, but it's optional. Okay? So I'll send out an email clarifying all these online assignments. But again, the homeworks, do them at least once. One, there's three homework assignments on there. Do them each once. There's a copy there for reinforcement if you want to do them. There's one quiz due the night before the next exam. And there's a PAL quiz, which is going to help you get ready for your lab exam. So there's really five things right now that you definitely want to look on the calendar. Three homeworks, a quiz for the lecture exam, a quiz for the lab exam. Okay? Five things that you definitely want to do. Next exam, 37 through 52, vocabulary. Uh, Noja or gnosis is knowledge. If you're giving in a prognosis, right, you're given knowledge, you're given knowledge in advance, right, in pro, in, in advance of something. Uh, gonads are your sex organs, your sex glands, and gran, we saw uh, the granulosum, right, the stratum granulosum, and in that layer of, of the epidermis, you could see little spots, little granular type structures as the cells were dying. Then we have gram or graphy. They're both talking about a picture or a recording of something. Uh, for example, a micrograph is a picture from a microscope, right, a micrograph. Or a um, radiograph, right, a picture from um, radiological study. Gravid or gravido referring to pregnancy and gyne referring to female or women. Think gynecology and female health issues. Halu is your great toe, your hallux actually, is your big toe. 
your hallux. And hapal or hapto both mean single. Uh, when the cell undergoes mitosis to make egg or sperm, those products, egg or sperm, are said to be haploid. They have one copy of all the chromosomes. Hemo or hemato both refer to blood, hematology, the study of blood. Um, hemopoiesis or hematopoiesis, same thing, both referring to the process of making blood in your skeleton. Hemi, half. For example, hemiplegia would be half paralysis, what you might experience after a stroke. Hepato, liver. Hepatitis, inflammation of the liver. Hetero, different. Histo, we've seen this one, tissue. Histology, the study of tissues. And then not to be confused, hystero, lies in hysterectomy, referring to the womb or to the uterus. Now, you'll see it spelled H-I or H-Y if it's English or British spelling. So don't be upset about that H-I or H-Y switch. Holo, the entire thing or the whole thing. We saw holocrine secretion, where the whole cell disintegrated or was destroyed in the process of releasing. Homo, same. Homeo, also same, but a little bit different. Um, we, we call it homeostasis, right? Because in homeostasis, we're keeping our blood sugar, for example, within a normal range. It's not homostasis. If it were homostasis, that means that our blood pressure would stay exactly a straight line, our blood sugar would stay exactly a straight line, right? So homeo and homo, they both mean same, but a slight difference. Hilo, clear or glossy, we've seen, or glassy, we've seen hyaline cartilage, very transparent cartilage at the end of bones, and hydro referring to water. Hyper and hypo, really common, really important ones. Hyper being above or over, and hypo being below or under. If something ends in IA, it's referring to a state or condition. So look at this example, hypoglycemia. It ends in IA, it's a condition. Emia, we already learned, is a condition of the blood. Hypo, low, glycosugar, right? So hypoglycemia, a condition of the blood where there's low sugar. And treatment, IATR. And I've got three uh, words here. You probably make, make one card with these. But IATR is a treatment. Look at podiatry or psychiatry. You'll see that IATR root in there referring to a, a, a tr uh, treatment. Or if it ends in iatrics, like pediatrics, referring to a, a medical specialty. And then you see I iatry again on the end, right? Iatry. So the same idea, IATR. Uh, iasis is an abnormal condition. And finally, ick pertaining to. We've already seen al and eel. Right, so al, ik, and eel all mean pertaining to at the end of a word. We'll go through this list. We'll keep going. Uh, I'll finish this one today, too. Idio. Idio means self or distinctive. If you have an idiopathic disease, it is such a unique set of, of symptoms that no one's really quite sure what's going on. It's a disease of unknown cause. It's very unique to yourself or very distinct. So I always tell myself, if you have an idiopathic doctor, or a doctor tells you you have an idiopathic condition, go find another doctor, right? But um, it's something very unique, very distinctive. Um, if a word ends in I-N, it usually is a protein. Not always, but oftentimes. So hemoglobin is a protein. It ends in I-N. There are exceptions to this, of course, like collagen, right? The most abundant protein in your body ends in E-N. So it's not always true. Infra, below and enter between. Those are also two very, very commonly used prefixes. So make sure you know hyper, hypo, infra, inter. These are used over and over and over throughout the course. Moving on, uh, we're going to go through 52. So I'll go through a few of them next time. And then we'll finish up with lucid. Right? We'll finish up through lucid. So this is going to be going back. Nausea through lucid. Nausea through lucid on exam number three. Is there a difference? Only one word. What you have is what they'll go to. So you're going to go through what's on your slide? Lunar. Lunar. So go to lunar. Okay? Whatever your slides are is what we'll go through. I apologize. So go through lunar, not lucid. Okay, let's take a look at 
the very, very end of chapter six. I'm not going to test you on this, but this is such an important little area at the very, very end um, that I, I don't, I feel badly to skip over it and not mention it. So we are finishing up with skin. Uh, I had you do the burn uh, case study and I treated that as bonus points, which is a big reason why I gave you those 14 points right on the exam is I had treated that quote as bonus and I asked you about the case study with the little girl in the, in the burn and uh, to know the different levels of, of uh, burns, first, second, and third degree burns. And in that uh, store, you may remember she was quite young, but she did have a serious injury to more than 40% of her body and she did have smoke inhalation. So she had two of those three risk factors and it tells you in the bottom, if you have two of those risk factors, you have a 33% chance of death. So there were a few students who had read through that. Now, I also want to just mention acne because it's something we probably all deal with. And I've got one slide on acne. Um, the, another name for acne is comedo, right? It's not that it's comedic or anything funny about it, but comedos. And uh, blackheads or acne come in two basic types, blackheads and whiteheads. And they're both plugged sebaceous glands. Remember, sebaceous glands are releasing oily-like substance. They release it through holocrine secretion. So you got gunky secretions coming up and plugging up the pores. And a blackhead is nothing more than a sebaceous gland that is plugged with that oily sebum, but it's open to the environment. And so as a result, it gets oxidized and turns black. Right? So a blackhead, it simply has poked through the surface. A whitehead is when that same sebaceous gland is plugged up underneath. Because it's underneath, it creates more pressure, more pain, more discomfort, and it doesn't get exposed to the surface, so it doesn't turn black. Okay. So in this picture, you see lovely blackheads. On this picture, when I looked for uh, pictures of the whiteheads, I found this family on vacation. Kind of weird, I know, but th those are the whiteheads. Okay. Uh, now, I'll also finish up every system with what happens to it as we age. What are the consequences of aging on each system? So as we look at the aging of the integument, some of these make really good sense. It's going to take longer for us to heal, right? We cut ourselves, it takes longer to heal. Those cells are not as resilient as they used to be. We're going to get more wrinkles, yay. Um, our skin will become less elastic. The, the collagen will become less uh, organized. Our skin's ability to fight off infection will be reduced. Those Langerhans cells will be fewer in number, and they won't be able to fight off as many bacteria that try to come into the epidermis. Our skin will become drier because those sebaceous glands will become less active. And while we don't want too much oil on our skin, we do want enough oil produced that our skin stays supple. We're going to have uh, an alteration in pigment on our skin that can lead to liver spots, those dark spots in the back of the hand, for example. And I'm getting a couple of them, so I guess I'm getting old. Um, also, you're going to have difficulty um, with temperature regulation as you get older because you'll sweat less, right? And as you sweat less, your body can't regulate your temperature as well. And go to a nursing home or go to a, you know, grandma's house and they're always complaining about how hot it cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. Just can't regulate their body temperature the way that they used to. Uh, hair follicles will become thinner or less hair altogether. Our skin will make less vitamin D. Vitamin D is important for bone uh, formation and health and so as a result of less vitamin D uh, we'll have more osteoporotic changes, more thinning of the bones. And with increased exposure to the sun with age, we'll also have a higher incidence of skin cancers. And that's what I just want to mention a little bit about skin cancers because it's so common and so many times preventable. So I just want to give this little shout out about skin cancers. It is the most common type of cancer. And you are at greatest risk if you have fair skin and have a history of excessive sun exposure. And this includes tanning beds. Okay, so no, nothing safe here. But the highest incidence of skin cancer will be from kids who had a very bad sunburns as a kid. Now, in this day and age, the last 20 years, we've had enough sense to put on sunscreen. And we put on you know, lotions onto our body. But before 20 years ago, that wasn't normal. You basically put Crisco on your body and you burned more. Right? In the old days, there wasn't white skin lotion or sun lotion. You just put on things to, to tan more. And so people were not as aware of this 
uh, 20 years ago. I know when I go out in the sun as a child, I would come home with big blisters. So I, would get, I still get second degree burns very easily from the sun. I'm that fair. Now remember that if you have a darker complexion, you have more melanin, and that melanin protects you from some of that UV radiation. It doesn't take you off the hook for being careful about skin cancer, but the darker your complexion, the more protected you are naturally from the sun's rays. Three basic types of skin cancer. And now you can tell me from the names where this cancer is originating in the skin. Basal cell carcinoma. If you're going to get a skin cancer, this is the one you're praying for. This is at the level of the stratum basale, right? That's the cell that's gone nuts. And these cancers seldom metastasize. They're usually also in very seeable places. So they're usually on the face, a place of high sun exposure. But we can see them. We get rid of them. They don't metastasize. Life is good, OK? Uh, the one you don't want to hear about is malignant melanoma. These can be very deadly. They're originating from melanocytes in the moles. Remember, moles, nevises are uh, overactive melanocytes. And these guys get really more active with more sun. If you have moles, it's very, very important that you are having your doctor check them out every year, not with a drive-by physical, right, but take everything off and turn around three times. You don't want to take a chance, especially in your back or someplace where you cannot see if you've had a history of sunburn. Because these things, by the time they become very noticeable on the surface, may have already metastasized in another place. And they become very, very dangerous. So you want to be really careful, again, especially if you have a history of sunburn. So this is what I'm looking out for. Every time I go to the doctor, we take everything off and we look. We just check everything out. Number three, squamous cell carcinoma. This one's kind of intermediate. But it makes sense to you, right, by the name. It's happening in one of those layers, not the basal layer, but in the spinosum. And uh, it's one of those keratinocytes that are in the uh, skin layers. And they can metastasize to the lymph nodes. And they're usually, again, in places where we see them, OK? So, so we usually catch them. But if you look at these, what you'll see is an irregular coloration. Right? If you saw something like that on your skin, you'd probably be alarmed. Before this, so these probably look like little moles or nothing at all. And so here are the rules. When you're seeing any kind of spot on your skin, you want to think about these A, B, C, D, E rules. Number one, do you see a change in the asymmetry? Is that bump, is that spot changing its border, its, its symmetry? So if he changes in the, in the movement of that, if you see a changing in the color, if you see it getting bigger in diameter, or you see it elevating, getting larger, higher, then you want to be alarmed. And you don't want to wait six months to go see the doctor, right? You just want to call up and say, hey, I've got this thing on me that's looking a little funky, and I'm a little bit nervous about it. And they'll usually get you in, lop it off, take a biopsy, make sure there's nothing issue there. And if your doctor, uh, when you go for your physicals, make sure they're taking a look at your moles and all your body spots, and they're rec recording how big they are. I mean, they, they truly should be recording where it is and how big it is. And um, the next time, comparing it, because these things change over time so slowly, you won't notice it, right? You won't notice it, and it may be too late if it metastasizes. So don't take any chances with it, and I'm not going to quiz you on this, right? Skin is over. Uh, the test is going to start with bones, but I felt bad about skipping over this because I think it's one of those public health messages that we all need to hear. Any questions on skin cancer that I may be able to entertain or anything about uh, aging of the skin? Yes? I don't know if I'm um, Why is it that some babies get baby acne? And Again, everybody has different glands and different secretions, and, and so some babies are more prone to it. Some adults are more prone to it. right? I mean, some people are blessed with perfect complexion, and other people struggle with it more. Um, it's not necessarily all about hygiene either, right? It's just who we are, the oils we produce, the hormones that are surging through us, and we can have issues with acne, and other people are just without it. Mm -hmm. okay. It usually just stops, right? It goes through phases and stages. Question in the back. If you have a mole and it's not, like, if it's not like a really level or anything, you see something that's covered up? Yes. That's what I'm saying. When you go to the doctor, if you've got a mole on your back or on your side or on your butt or whatever. I have one on my wrist and I have one on my chest. But I'm when you go to the doctor, you want to make sure they're taking a look at it, right? So don't do a drive by physical, right? Don't do just, oh, your heart, your lungs, your you know, breathing. And, and no, I mean, just take it all off, because you, you know 
They don't, may not be aware of it. So just be really conscious if you've got some of those spots in your body in, in hard to see places, take it off, right? Don't take any chances. It's just something really good to be mindful of. Anything else? Okay, let's start the chapter on the skeletal system. And I should be able to get through uh, this presentation with you. And I think you're going to find this to be very comfortable because you've already heard a huge amount of this story from Mr. Mueller from your lab objectives. Now, this is, again, i got to change the numbers. This is Chapter 6, so make a note. I think it's correct in your pack, and you may not even be able to see it. But this is Chapter 6 on the skeletal system from your Martini textbook. Now, I have not been to this particular church in Prague, but apparently there were so many bones during the dark, uh, during the plague years, that they actually used human bones to create and decorate the church. So the chandeliers are made of human ribs, and you'll see the skulls all through the, the cathedral ceilings. Uh, kind of grotesque, right? But bones, you know, they hang around for a long time. So I guess it makes for a good building material. Now, let's take a look, think about the skeletal system. I think by now you know it's not just a series of sticks sitting in your body that give you structure and attach to your muscles. Uh, bones are very dynamic. They are living tissue. And if you think of a bone like an organ, right? remember organs um, are composed of tissues. If I give you a bone, you would be able to find mostly bony connective tissue. But within that bone, there are going to be blood vessels. And blood vessels have around them some endothelial, some epithelial cells, and blood vessels also have smooth muscle in them. So you would find a little bit of muscle in bone, you would find a little bit of epithelial in bone, and you would find nerves traveling through bone. So again, we get the idea that organs are composed of all four tissues in a unique and different arrangement. Bones are going to interact, or this whole skeletal system is going to interact with the other systems. And I'll be sharing more about that with you on Thursday. I know that we learn these systems in isolation, right? This week it's the skeletal system, next week it's the muscular system, and then it'll be the cardiovascular system. But we need to also be thinking that these systems are not in isolation. They're not in vacuums, and they do communicate one with another. So on Thursday, I will uh, start making you think about how is it that the skeletal system interacts with other systems. This system is constantly changing. It's very dynamic, like I said. It's constantly rebuilding and remodeling. The skeleton that you have right now was totally different five years ago. So your bones have been replaced completely and will continue to change and modify and replace themselves throughout your lifespan. The skeletal system includes not only the bones, but also the cartilage and the ligaments that are going to stabilize or connect the bones one to another. Of course, the bones are supporting our weight interacting with our muscles for movement, allowing us to do all the activities that we do. Bones are also very important for mineral storage, specifically calcium and phosphorus. And I'll, I have a slide on this coming up in a moment. But calcium and phosphorus are two very important components of your bone. What makes your bone hard is a calcium phosphate concrete-like material. And don't forget, too, that uh, in your bones, you have blood cell production occurring, and that process is called hematopoiesis, as is spelled here, or you might see just hemopoiesis. It's the same thing, just a different variation on the same process. So just to, just to restate, right, the bones, this, this part we get, bones are protective, right? They protect our organs. So you can figure this out. The, the brain is protected by the cranial bones. The spinal cord is protected by the vertebra. The heart and the lungs are protected by the ribs and the sternum. We get this. Not hard. Not a problem there. Uh, the bones, obviously, are also interacting with the muscles to allow movement. And, what I, and we'll be talking about origins and insertions in lab. And that's the whole idea that, you know, bones and muscles are interacting and pulling our our skeleton in predictable ways. The thing I want you thinking about is, too, that bone uh, is where your red blood cells and your white blood cells and your platelets are formed. All of your blood cells are made in the spongy bone inside your bones. And in lab, um, you saw the big femur when we did the long bone anatomy. And in a young child, there's a greater percentage of red bone marrow in your body. That is bone marrow that's still actively making blood. As we get older, we don't need quite as much. So some of that red bone marrow gets replaced by yellow bone marrow. 
So when you look in an adult femur, right, if you cut into a femur or a humerus or some other bone, most of that uh, uh, diaphysis would be filled with fat, right? And we saw that in the lab with the cut bone. In you and me as adults, where we still have active hematopoiesis is pretty much in what we call the flat bones. And I'll tell you more about the flat bones in a moment. But where you're still making blood would be pretty much in the skull, frontal bone. Uh, you've got a lot of blood production still happening in your vertebra, in your ribs, in the sternum, in your os coxa, and finally, as you saw, in the proximal head of your femur and of your humerus. Okay, so up the top of your humerus, top of your femur, you still have some red bone marrow there. Everything else is now yellow bone marrow and is non-hematopoietic. Big, big, big deal is that your bones are storing calcium and phosphate. These are two critical minerals for your body's normal functioning. Calcium is critical for your muscles to work. Calcium is critical for your nerves to work properly. And calcium is critical for your blood to clot properly. So without proper calcium levels, we are not going to function very well and your body maintains calcium levels quite tightly. A lot of homeostatic regulation going on to keep your calcium levels balanced. There's also phosphorus. And when you think of phosphorus, I hope you think of ATP, right? That, that ATP, that energy molecule that the mitochondria make, that P is for phosphorus. So we need a lot of phosphorus available. And you may also remember that your DNA and your RNA, the backbone of that molecule, is a sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate, sugar phosphate backbone. So phosphate's hugely important in energy, ATP, as well in the production of your uh, DNA and RNA. So I'll, I just want to point out that we need to have this well-regulated, and our body needs a constant supply of these two minerals. So I told you the skeletal system is not only bones, but also the cartilage that holds all this together. So let's take a look at cartilage, and you already know this story. You really do. You know, well, most of this story. If I said cartilage to you and I asked you what kind of cells are in cartilage, you would tell me with great confidence cartilage has in it chondrocytes, right? And those chondrocytes were those cells looking back at you like little eyeballs when you look at cartilage, and those cells are sitting in a space called a lacunae. That's true. Um, but I want to add to this story a little bit the cell's chondroblasts. You know that fibroblasts are cells that make fibers, that make proteins, right? They make the collagen and the elastic fibers that we see in connective tissue. Blast means to germinate or to bud. We've seen that in our vocabulary list. So chondroblasts are actually the cells that are making cartilage. Once they make the cartilage, once they make the, the semi-solid material, and the cell is surrounded by that cartilage material, then we change the cell's name to a chondrocyte. And basically, they kind of go into semi-retirement. Remember that cartilage is, mature cartilage is avascular, and that there's three major functions of cartilage. Number one, supporting soft tissues. Um, your, your nose, right, your ear, mostly cartilage. It's, it's supporting and protecting some soft tissue areas. You've also got at the ends of all of your bones, where two bones articulate, you've got a nice thin layer of hyaline cartilage, that white cartilage. And then don't forget, too, that your skeleton when you were a fetus was made up of cartilage, hyaline cartilage, and became bone. And we'll go through that process a little bit today. Remember I told you the skeletal system is not only the bones and the cartilage, but also the structures that hold it all together. So what are those structures? We've got tendons. You know from lab or tonight that tendons are connectors between bone and muscle. Then there's another type of tendon-like material that is not a cord, but instead is a flat sheet. And you'll see that on the some cell models upstairs across the abdominal region. Right, that's an aponeurosis that goes across the abdominal muscles, across the six-pack muscles. There's also an aponeurosis that goes across the top of the skull, a flat sheet of tendon. And aponeuroses connect muscle to muscle. And then the other type of connector is what connects one bone to another bone, and that is ligaments. 
So know these three different connectors. Now they're all made of the same stuff, right? They're all made of dense, regular connective tissue. We've seen it under the lab, under the microscope. We know what dense, regular connective tissue is. It's just arranged in different ways or is connecting different stuff. And so it gets a different name, right? A tendon, a ligament, or an aponeurosis. In lab last week, in the early objectives of that lab, there was um, in the chapter unit seven of your Amerman book, there was a section in there about uh, long bone anatomy. There was a section in there about histology of bone. There was a section in there about what happens when you put a bone in acid or when you bake a bone, right? What happens to the material of the bone? In that section was also a page or, a page or so classifying bones by their shape. And we looked at long bones, right? We looked at long bone anatomy, but there are also short bones. There are also irregular bones, and there are flat bones. So long bones, uh, like your femur, like the humerus, even your little phalanges in your fingers and your toes are considered long bones. They're just miniature little long column-like bones. They have a diaphysis. They have the epiphyses. Then there are some short bones. They're kind of cubic-shaped. These would be the uh, carpals. The tarsals are considered uh, short bones, as well as the patella. So anything chicken nugget shaped is going to be um, a, a short bone. And then there's flat bones. Flat bones, makes sense. Sternum, ribs, um, scapula, very thin, flat. Even your frontal bone, your skull bones are considered flat bones. It doesn't make, it's not like they're flat on the table, but if you took your two fingers and ran them on the inside and the outside, right, you would find that the diameter doesn't change very much. So they're flat even though they're curved. And then there are the irregular bones, and those are the really strangely shaped ones like the vertebra. Um, some of your, uh, like the temporal bones, kind of weird, uh, the ethmoid, the sphenoid, those are considered irregulars. So just to show this to you um, in picture. Now, whenever I see a bone marking from this point on, I'm going to point it out. And for the next 10 days, right, we're going to be looking at bone markings, trying to get these things in our head. And when I look at this example on the far left of a long bone, what bone is this? What is the bone on the left? Did we see a femur? Okay, now, um, parts of it. This big rounded section is the head. The narrow region is the neck. This big bump on the femur is the greater trochanter. And this button down here, this little bump, is the lesser trochanter. At the far end, and it's not easy to see on this side, but on the other side, on the posterior side, there are big rounded knobs. Those are the condyles, medial and lateral condyles of the femur. And there's like a little bump on each side of the condyles, and those are referred to as the epicondyles. Not, not really showing here, but... When you go back and look at the femur, those are all the bone markings you need to know from the femur. So we have the long bones, right? Uh, then there are the short bones, anything that's sort of like a tarsal or a carpal or a, a, a patella. Then there are the flat bones. Uh, the frontal bone is an example, but also the sternum, the ribs, and then finally the irregular bones. They're just shaped by, they're just classified by shape. We've already seen the story on long bone anatomy. Uh, except in the lab, the example on the picture would have been a femur, I do believe, right? So you had a femur there. Here, what bone is this? What bone are we looking at here? I'm still seeing a rounded head region. So this is the humerus. And at the, um, at the distal end, this pulley-like structure that articulates with the ulna is called the trochlea. And this little rounded knob right there that articulates with the radius is called the capitulum. I know some of you are going to be racing through that bone marking list tonight, and some of you have already seen it. Um, but I'm just going to keep saying it until you hear it, until you know it. So when we look at this, we know that this is a bone of adult length. And how do we know that this bone has reached its adult length? What do I see on this bone? Well, you know what? This bone doesn't show any marrow. Now, I agree that if this, 
this should show some yellow bone marrow in there, and it doesn't, right? There's no bone marrow showing in this picture at all. But there's something else that tells me this bone has reached its, long, its, its adult length. Yeah, I see the epiphyseal line, right? It's right here. You see that line. That line tells me that this bone is done growing longer. It has reached its adult length. If this was a 12-year-old child's humerus, you would see a gap right there. And that gap would be cartilage. And that gap would be called the growth plate or the epiphyseal plate. When you're looking at the parts of the long bone, this is true if it's a phalanx or the big femur. You're always going to have the shaft, right, the shaft of the bone, and this is better called the diaphysis. Then you're going to have the two ends of the bone, epiphyses, right, proximal and distal epiphyses. All your long bones are in your appendicular skeleton, so they're all going to have proximal and distal ends, right, proximal and distal epiphyses. Uh, on the outside, there's going to be a layer of tissue called the periosteum. There are going to be foramina along the way, right? Ways for blood to go in and out of the bones. There's going to be articulating cartilage at the ends where the bone articulates with other bones. Those are all the standard things you've already seen in a long bone. What's new here for you is that there's another area called the metaphysis. Metaphysis. It's, it's where the growth plate would be, right? So in a younger bone, that area where the growth plate is visible, that area is called the metaphysis. It's in between the diaphysis and the epiphysis. And what does that word physis mean? We keep seeing it, right? This, these five letters, physis. Growth, okay? So... Epiphysis, growth at the ends, right, upon the growth plate, on the ends. Diaphysis, uh, the bone gets larger in diameter, across. And then in the, in the medullary cavity, there would be yellow bone marrow, right? And I don't see that here. They didn't put any bone marrow on this image. Because this is the humerus, the vast majority of this would have in it some yellow. All right, there would be yellow bone marrow. I'll kind of overemphasize it. This would be full of, of uh, Crisco, right? Full of yellow fat. And up at the very top, you'd have red bone marrow, right? Because this is one of the few places um, in the adult where you still have some active hemopoiesis. So know the parts of your long bone anatomy. Let me zip in here a little bit closer, though, a couple of things you don't yet know or haven't been exposed to. So again, here's our humerus. And we're going to take just a quick look at this box, right? We're going to zoom into this box and go up here. And we're on the outside edge of the bone. And what you're going to see is that there's a layer that kind of pulls off the bone. That's the periosteum, right? We've seen that before. That's the outer layer, the perimeter, peri, around the bone. And then we're going to look at another box, and we're going to go here, and we're going to look at the inside layer, pretty much at the interface between the compact bone and the spongy bone. That interface between the compact bone and the spongy bone at the marrow cavity is referred to as the endosteum. Endoosteum, right, within the bone. So periosteum around the outside, endosteum within the bone. Again, we've seen these, we've seen these prefixes. What we're going to find is that, um, well, let's go back to the periosteum. What do we see here? I see bugs. Do you see bugs? See the bugs? It's just like that birthday cake model upstairs, a bone. It looks like a piece of birthday cake at the picnic, right, with ants on it. And those ants really are, these little bugs really are what? The osteocyte in a lacuna. And the little legs of the bug represent the canaliculi, right, the, the canals that connect one cell, one lacuna to another. And we can see that it's arranged in layers, right, where each of these layers is a lamella. If we go into the endosteum, we're going to see a few extra cell types here. I still see my bugs, right, my osteocytes with their little canaliculi, and I still see layering effects. But layered on the outside of the, of the bone and on the inside, we're on the inside, right, are some other cells, and these cells are called osteoblasts. I just kind of introduced this story to you a moment ago. Right, chondroblasts built the cartilage, 
And once they had built it, they go into semi-retirement, and we call them chondrocytes. Same story here. We've got osteoblasts that are going to be actively building the bone. So blast for building. And they're going to be building the bone. And once they cocoon themselves in this matrix of calcium and phosphate and collagen, then we're going to change their name to osteocytes. Okay, so the sites are mature cells. The blasts are still building their home, building their environment. There's another cell out here that I'm going to show you more of in a moment, and that is an osteoclast. Okay, the only one letter difference. And you know from your vocab that clast means to break down. So osteoclasts are cells that are going to be breaking bone down. Osteoblasts, with a B, are going to be building or producing bone. And throughout our lifetime, these two, bone, these two bone cells are at war with each other in a way, and one is building and one is breaking down. And while building up sounds good and breaking down sounds bad, there has to be this constant flux. When you, when you have a lot of calcium, your body says, okay, let's build some more bone. And when you don't have enough calcium in your body to maintain function, the osteoclasts start chewing up the bone to release the calcium. And you have this constant battle going on between these cell types. So going through these, these four cell types in your bones, let me start with the one that we know, or at least have heard of the most. And these are the osteocytes. Up until now, you heard about them being in a lacuna, right? When you looked at compact bone under the microscope, osteocytes were in the lacunae, in the circular arrangement of the osteon. But those osteocytes, before they housed themselves in the lacunae, they were called what? Osteoblasts, right? They were actively building or making the bone. OK, now the question is, where did those come from? Well, the osteoblasts come from a cell type called an osteoprogenitor cell. These are basically stem cells, right? These are stem cells. They're sitting there in the bone. They're waiting to do their work and they keep replenishing the supply of bone cells. So like any other stem cell, it's just, it's always there replenishing the supply. We find these osteoprogenitor cells at the periosteum and the endosteum. In other words, on the outside edge and on the inside edge of compact bone. So all the changes that we're going to see in bone are gonna come from the outside edge and on the inside edge of the compact bone. There's a completely different kind of cell. It has a different derivation. It's a totally different cell, and these are the osteoclasts. Okay? They are actually macrophages. Now, in the skin, the macrophage that I mentioned were the Langerhans cells, right? those cells that could kind of gobble up bacteria that got into the skin. So they were a macrophage kind of cell in the skin. In the bone, the macrophage type of cell is the osteoclast. I'm going to show you a picture of these in a moment. But these are humongous cells. They're huge. And they dissolve the bone by releasing hydrochloric acid. What did you learn in lab? Did Mr. Mueller talk about what happens when acid is added to bone? Right? What happens to acid when, what happens to a bone when you add acid to it? It gets soft. It breaks down. And what's specifically getting broken down is the calcium phosphate cement, right, that's in our bones. That's why our Greek statues are losing their features. Acid rain is eating away. It's why you shouldn't, I'm not going to say drink, don't drink soda, I do it all the time, but just don't gargle with it, right? Don't keep it in your mouth so long because that acid on your teeth is not good over time, okay? Um, so osteoclasts are releasing acid, and it does dissolve the mineral components, right? So too much soda, that too much acid can start to erode the enamel and the bony structures of your teeth. So let's take a look at a picture of these and realize that they're both necessary. As we get older, we hear a lot about osteoporosis, and we get worried about our bones getting too brittle. And osteoclasts are a big part of that problem. But you also want to realize that as you're developing, your bones are the shape that they are because the osteoblast built it, and the osteoclast came along and kind of carved it out. You know, sculpted out the shape of your bones. So the osteoblasts and the osteoclasts are always in a constant battle 
of forming and shaping and rechanging your bones and also building and releasing calcium and phosphate for your metabolism. So the picture on the top is a cartoon of an osteoclast. It is huge, especially when you realize that that's a lacuna, and that would be a normal size osteocyte in that lacuna. And now you see this humongous cell. This cell is on the outside edge of the bone. It has these long, um, sort of finger-like extensions, and they're going to be releasing hydrochloric acid from this edge, and that's going to eat away at the bone, and you see how the bone is kind of getting an indentation, right? It's eating away at the bone. As it's eating away at the bone, it's releasing calcium, and it's releasing phosphorus, and reshaping the bone. On the bottom is a micrograph, and we've never seen bone in this coloring, but all of this up here is bone, okay? And these are little osteocytes in their lacunae, and this monster is a osteoclast, right? So it's huge, absolutely huge. Just wanted to see that. And then these images are also of, an, of actually three or four different osteoclasts, right? So these are just big cells. You really don't get a perspective of how big they are here. But the next time you see that image, those are still going to be osteoclasts, OK? When you see that picture again, osteoclast. It can be. Uh, it, I'll talk about this a little bit on Thursday, but all of the Fosamax and all the, you know, the medications right now for osteoporosis do work in part by slowing down the activity of osteoclasts so that we slow down the breakdown of bone. Um, now, there are other kinds of brittle bone disease. I'm assuming you mean like just an aging phenomenon? Well, I There are some brittle bone diseases of young people, right? And that, that is more about development of the bone, uh, not so much about the osteoclast being out of control, but there's an issue with the actual building of the bone that's defective. The collagen's defective. There's something else in the making of the bone that's wrong. But um, when we think about people getting older and their bones becoming more brittle or porous, that does include osteoclasts. Okay. Now, I mentioned uh, long bones. And I mentioned flat bones. And flat bones have a slightly different architecture. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on them, but I want you to appreciate the difference. So flat bones, like, the, you know, like your sternum, like your ribs, like your frontal bone, are actually two layers of compact bone on the inside and the outside. And in between those two layers is a layer of spongy bone. And that spongy bone has a funny little nickname called the diploid. Okay. And uh, it's interesting, or at least it's a fact, that the compact bone, each side of it, does have a periosteum. So there is an outside layer called the periosteum on the inside and the outside, or on both sides of that bone. But there is no endosteum. So there's no layer on the inside where you would find osteoclasts and osteoblasts. So let's take a chunk. Let's take a look at this bone. So this is a, a, a section of flat bone. In fact, while we're doing this, let's go ahead and quiz ourselves on bones, OK? So looking at the skull up here, I point, you tell. Uh, this bone? Parietal. This bone? Occipital. Occipital. This bone? Temporal. Temporal. Frontal. Sphenoid. Sphenoid. Zygomatic, maxilla. maxilla, and mandible. Now, bone markings. That bump? Mastoid process. Mastoid process. This long, skinny process. Oh, it's way too big. That long, skinny process right here, also in the temporal bone, is the styloid process. This opening in the side of the skull in the temporal bone for the ear canal is the external, external auditory or external acoustic meatus. OK, good. OK, so I'm just going to quiz you every time I can. OK, now, really all I wanted you to see here, though, oops, is that you're taking a little chunk out of the parietal bone here. And what you see on this flat bone, a layer of compact bone, another layer of compact bone with a layer of spongy bone in between. Right, so that's what compact bone, so that's what uh, flat bone looks like. 
And the outside, there's a layer of periosteum. On the inside, there's a layer of periosteum. And there is no endosteum in this. What you're seeing below it is actually the outer covering of the brain. Right, so down here, this would be the dura mater. We'll get to that when we get to the brain in a few weeks. So that's how flat bone is different from long bones. You also know this story very well, but I like this picture. This is the microanatomy or the histology of compact bone. You know these structures. You've been quizzed on them. You've been, you've been over this. So hopefully this feels very familiar. But I really like the scanning electromicrograph at the very top. It gives you a different perspective as you think about these osteon structures. Remember that an osteon is a cylinder, right? So we're seeing a portion of the cylinder in this picture. So imagine you've got this big cylinder, and it's three-dimensional, right? That's what I like about this. And we can see that whole um, cylinder is called a what? Right, an osteon or Haversian system. And in the very center of this osteon is a very nicely seen now central canal or Haversian canal. You can also appreciate that there are layers, right? Layers that make up this osteon. And each of those you know is called a lamellae. What's arranged in a circular arrangement are these uh, lacunae. And in those lacunae, you find the osteocytes. So again, these are lacunae. And in those lacunae, if this were living tissue, there would be osteocytes hanging out in those. They've already made their bone. They're just hanging out in semi-retirement in the lacunae. Those cells need to communicate one with another. They need to get oxygen. They need to get, you know, they're living cells. But they're locked inside a bony matrix. So they need to talk to each other. And they need to get their nutrients. And they do so through canaliculi. Now, this top picture doesn't show the canaliculi very well. The bottom picture shows a better job. But you see all those cracks, right? All those little cracks, or on our pictures, all those little legs of the ants, those are the canaliculi. And it's allowing for the diffusion of molecules in and out of those cells. You cannot see, on this image, Volkmann's canals. They were the seventh structure that I asked you to know in bone. And you can, however, see those Volkmann canals in this next three-dimensional image. So this looks like our birthday cake model upstairs, that chunk of bone, that big model. And just to highlight a couple things, you're looking at, imagine this is the chunk of bone coming from the outside edge of the humerus. Okay? And you've got, again, an outer layer called the periosteum. You've got all of this area that is compact bone made up of these uh, osteons. And these osteons are tall, cylindrical structures. They go down the long axis of the bone. And here is one central canal. Here's another central canal. It's filled with blood vessels and with nerves. And then connecting from side to side. That would be a Volkmann's canal. Okay? So the Volkmann's canal are connecting one central canal to another central canal. The other name for those are the um, perforating canals. They kind of perforate through the layers. So this would be a, a, a Volkmann's canal. This would be a Volkmann's canal. Right? They're just connecting the blood flow throughout the, the bone. And then this layer here, actually what we're seeing here, that webby stuff, that would be the spongy bone. And the border, right, the border between this, right here, I would call that border the endosteum, right? The border between the compact bone and the inner spongy bone is the endosteum. And keep in mind, that's where those osteocytes and those osteoclasts are hanging out, right? So the osteoclasts and the osteoblasts are hanging out at this endosteum, and they're hanging out at the periosteum because bone is going to grow from the outside edges. So you, you've heard it said that your skeleton was first hyaline cartilage, most of it, and that it became bone. And this process of cartilage becoming bone is referred to as ossification. Right? Your, your, the cartilage became ossified. You went through a process of ossification to make your bones. It turns out there's two kinds of ossification, two ways that we make bone. I'm only going to really show you one of them. 
The first one I'm not going to show you. It's called intramembranous ossification. And as the name suggests, this is bone that happens within, intra, a membrane. Okay, so intramembranous is going to happen within a membrane, intramembranous. And this is how your flat bones are formed. Okay, I'm not going to show that to you. Okay, I just want you to know that it's a little bit different in the making of your flat bones. Your long bones, your short bones, the irregular bones, they are going to be formed by what's called endochondrial ossification. Now, what does that tell us? That the bone came from, quote, within cartilage, right? So first cartilage, then bone. And that's your flat bones. Sorry, back it up. Uh, endochondrial is going to be your long bones, your short bones, and your irregular bones. So I'm going to show you this kind. I'm going to show you how this happens step by step. Think about a two-year-old. Think about you. Um, the bones certainly are going to grow in two different directions. Bones are going to get bigger in diameter, right? Think about the shaft of the bone. It's going to get bigger in diameter, and bones are going to get longer. No surprise there. The increase in diameter of a bone is referred to as appositional growth or apposition. So as the bone gets bigger in diameter, that's appositional growth, and we'll see that in a moment. You'll see how you basically put down layer after layer, and it gets thicker and thicker. Bones also grow longer at the growth plate, and that is also referred to as endochondrial growth. So again, it's confusing, I know, because I told you endochondrial ossification, right? Starts with cartilage, then bone. But there's also endochondrial growth, which means that the growth is occurring, again, within cartilage. So we're going to see how the bone gets longer starting from cartilage and moving toward bone. So the first image I have here is for appositional growth. That is greater in diameter. We're looking at a femur, and we're going to take a cut, a transverse cut through the femur. And this is an infant, a child a young adult, and an, an uh, adult. And what do you notice? Right? Over the span of years, this femur is doing what? As far as widening, right? it's getting bigger in total diameter. And you also notice that the compact bone is itself getting thicker. Right? So the compact bone is getting thicker, and the entire bone is getting greater in diameter. What do you call the shaft of a long bone? The diaphysis, right? And the way I remember that word, physis means growth, dia means across. Is it not obvious that as a bone develops, it gets wider across, right? The shaft gets bigger. Dia, physis, growth across. So that's how I remember that word, diaphysis. So what you see is that the, the compact bone is certainly getting thicker, and the overall bone is getting bigger in diameter. Where is this change happening? Well, much of it's happening on the inside at the endosteum. Some of it's also happening at the outside periosteum. But much of it's happening from the inside of the bone. It's thickening. Well, what kind of cells are found at the endosteum? Again, osteoclasts and osteoblasts, right? You have both of those cells sitting there at that edge. And they're, they're constantly making and breaking down, making and breaking down the bone throughout your lifespan. When cells deposit bone, build bone, right? When the osteoblasts build bone, we say that the bone has been deposited. Deposition has occurred. When osteoclasts break down bone, we say that it has been resorbed, right? So resorption is the removal of bone by osteoclasts. Deposition, depositing, building is done by osteoblasts as they make new bone. So that's how bones get bigger in diameter, but how do bones get longer? And again, this is that endochondrial ossification. It's going to start off with cartilage, hyaline cartilage. And again, this is how your irregular, your long, and your short bones are going to be formed, not your flat bones. So we start off by looking at a chunk of cartilage. That's what this blue chunk is over here on the left. Notice there is no blood vessels. It, um, 
It's just a chunk of cartilage. Now, remember cartilage came from your mesoderm, right? That middle layer of the embryo is where all of your connective tissues come from. So you've got this chunk of cartilage. It kind of looks like a bone, right? It's kind of a young bone. It doesn't have much shape yet. And this cartilage would have around it a layer referred to as the perichondrium, right? Just like periosteum around the bone, perichondrium is this layer around the outside of the cartilage. It's an avascular chunk, right? There's no blood vessels. And then uh, these cells inside, I see, cap I see eyeballs looking at me, right? So what kind of cells are sitting inside the cartilage? Those would be good old chondrocytes, right? Chondrocytes sitting inside making cartilage. Notice this is still an avascular tissue. There's no blood going inside this chunk of cartilage yet. What happens is that blood starts coming around the outside. And as a result, the outside starts getting a little bit bony. When cartilage gets oxygen, it becomes bony. Okay, um, Cartilage needs to stay in a non-oxygen environment. It needs to stay avascular. And when blood vessels permeate in to cartilage, it will become ossified. It will change into bone. So what you see is that blood vessels begin to permeate into the collar portion of the bone or of the cartilage. And now this is going to cause all of this to become ossified, to become bone-like. You also will notice that blood vessels begin to permeate into the two epiphyses. You don't see bone, however. You don't see bone forming in two areas. There's going to be two areas that are going to stay cartilage, and those will become the growth plates, or are the growth plates. As development goes on, this middle picture would probably be a good representation of my 12-year-old's humerus, right? If I took a look at his humerus, what would I see? I'd see bone at the epiphyses, and I would see bone, right, in the middle of his humerus. But I would still see a nice, big cartilage growth plate. And that's what's shown here. And we would also remember we use that word metaphysis to describe that. So the metaphysis is that area of the long bone where the growth plate is. And that's, that's still cartilage. And those, those chondrocytes are dividing. And as they divide, right, they're pushing and making the bone longer. So the bone is getting longer from its two ends, from the two epiphyses, epiphysis, on the growth. That's where that gets its name, right? Epiphysis, on the growth, above the growth plate. Now, once this bone reaches adult length, there are some hormonal changes that we'll talk about in a moment, and that's going to cause the growth plate to fuse and close down. And now, in the adult, right, there's no more gap, there's no more growth plate, now I see that epiphyseal line on the x-ray, okay, telling me this bone is not going to grow any longer. Endochondrial growth, lengthening of the bone is done. And we get blood, we get blood and bone contiguous all the way through the whole thing. Look at this x-ray. I think this is so cool. Uh, this is a nine-month-old little guy or gal. And then we've got a two-year-old, then five, uh, three, and then five years old. Is it any wonder why you can take, I, I'm amazed that nine months old kids can start walking, right? Because look at their little bones. They're not even touching each other. They're nowhere near articulating. Those little metatarsals aren't anywhere near the tarsals, aren't anywhere near the phalanges. It's no wonder you can squeeze little baby's feet into little shoes, right? Just you know, squeeze them in there. They don't complain. The bones aren't touching. They're not hurting, right? You're just kind of squeezing that foot into that, into that little shoe. And as they grow longer, you see the bones are getting longer, they're getting bigger around, the tarsals are beginning to make their arrangement and start setting up the ankle more completely. And if you look at this x-ray, what I want you to see, and let me find a couple of good places on here. Do you see right here? There's a gap, right? You can't see it in every one of these, but that's the growth plate. You can see that there's a gap. There's another one up here. Those, are, those aren't anomalies. Those are actually the growth plate. You can see that there's a space at the epiphysis of the bone. And that's telling me that that bone is not yet reached, it reached its adult length and that it's still actively growing longer. 
Okay, and you look around, you'll see them depending upon the angle of the x-ray. Right, you see them up here as well. Here's one. Right, they're all over the place if you look for them. Those are all growth plates. Now, look at an adult's foot. All the bones have articulated. Everything's touching, right? It's easier to label, for sure. We've got our metatarsals and our phalanges. Now the space that you're seeing is not a growth plate. That space you're seeing there is actually the joint space, right, where the bones are coming together. There'd be hyaline cartilage on the very end, and you would want that to be a nice regular space for a nice healthy joint space. If you look around, you'll find a couple of places where you can actually see a dark line. And that dark line would basically, like here's one, that dark line that I'm seeing, that would represent the epiphyseal line. There's no more gap. The gap you're seeing is now a joint space. Do you see the difference? So here, that joint, that space is the actual joint space. Back here, the space we were seeing at the ends of bones, like here, that's not, oops. The gap we're seeing here, right, that's not a growth, that's not a, that's not a, um, a uh, joint space. That's actually, that gap is the growth plate. This would be the joint space. Yes? Why can you see it better on everything else but the nine-month-old? The nine-month-old grows faster than the two-year-old. Yeah, it's just the angle. Oh. It's just the angle. Yeah, but there would, be, there would definitely be growth plates in there. Okay? So it just gives you an idea, right? I mean, it's just amazing to me that a little foot can, can hold on the weight of the baby walking around and, and his bones aren't even anywhere near articulating with each other. If you look at a young skeleton, I mean, if you watch enough Bones kind of shows or CSI shows and they find a body and they can identify the sex by changes in the skeleton, but they can also identify the, the approximate age of the person at the time of their death because they look for a combination of growth plates, they look for a combination of dental changes, teeth and molars that have erupted, things like that, and they can come up with a pretty good age of that individual at the time of death. For example, here on the femur, you can actually see this gap. I mean, you can see that there's a gap here between the head of the femur, right? There's a gap in there. There's a gap over here, too, uh, between the, the bone and that greater trochanter. That gap is not like a fracture or broken. There's truly a, a growth plate there where it's still going to be growing and, and elongating. Whereas in the adult, you see it's fused, right, as, a, as an epiphyseal line. Now, there are stages as bone is formed from cartilage. It is true that there are about five different layers, and I'm not going to dive into those layers. So in Martini, if you see a discussion about five layers going from cartilage to bone, I'm not going to go there. I'm not going to worry about that. But I do want you to realize that this process of ossifying doesn't finish until about age 25 in some individuals. So it starts around age 10, depending upon sex and age and other uh, genetic things and environmental things. Uh, there are constant changes in one skeleton, and um, some of this doesn't completely finish ossifying or fusing until uh, early in the 20s. So muscle, sorry, muscle, bone is constantly changing. Right? That's really the bottom line here. It's constantly changing. There's a constant deposition of bone, new both new bone being formed during development and during young years. From about age 25 through 50 or so, there's a continuity, a, a pretty much a steady state of bone. Not many changes are happening. And then as one ages, there are some changes that are happening at the far end of life. Um, I shouldn't say 50s far end, but at the other end, right? So we start seeing changes there as well. Now, about 20% of your skeleton is replaced every year. So you could think every five years, right? You've got a brand new skeleton. So let's take care of it. Let's do the best we can with it because uh, it's always, always changing. And again, as your bone is being broken down and replaced, you're releasing and maintaining your calcium levels, maintaining your phosphate levels, and that chewing and rebuilding is happening at the edges, right? At the periosteal edge and at the endosteal edge. So what influences the growth of your bones? There's a hormone produced by your brain, uh, actually in your pituitary gland. We'll deal with that later when we get to the endocrine system. But it's called growth hormone, easy to remember. And you can imagine that it must be important for growth. This hormone is produced more in a young person and um, 
after we reach puberty, it starts to kind of slow down a little bit. But there are individuals who have a tumor in the brain, a tumor in the pituitary gland. And they have specials on TLC about these seven-foot giants in China, right? And they have a glandular hormone issue. And the tumor is overproducing growth hormone. And they never stop growing. And they're getting taller. And they're at seven feet, and they're growing, and their joints are wearing out, and their heart can't pump the blood up all that far. And they're having all sorts of issues. So growth hormone you know, normally uh, helps push and lengthen the skeleton to a point. Sex hormones are also very, very important. So estrogen, right, which starts being produced in large amounts at the time of puberty in women, uh, actually causes the growth plate to close down and encourages the ossification, the bone formation of all of the leftover cartilage in the body. This is why most women are they're going to be their adult height within about a year and a half of menses. So when menstruation starts, ladies think back, from about the time you started menstruating to your final height that you are now, probably 18 to 24 months. Right? You didn't grow much after that. That was it. You reached a, 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 a top. Guys, however, when they reach puberty, which happens a little bit later than women usually, right? Guys have a little bit later uh, puberty start. Testosterone actually encourages the growth plate to go, grow faster. So that's why guys have that big, tall growth spurt and the girls stop, right? The, the estrogen slows them down. Um, in fact, there's even, I've seen studies, I'm not sure how valid they are, that guys should avoid soy products, right? Because soy products have estrogen-like molecules in them, and they could actually be you know, slowing down their ability to grow taller. I don't know how much of an, of a, of an effect it has, right? But uh, I have heard that mentioned. So again, guys grow taller because of testosterone. Women tend not to grow as tall because of their estrogen. There's also the influence of vitamins. This is not an issue in our country very much anymore in the Western world where we've got supplemented milk and things. But historically, and in some countries where the diet isn't as well con constructed, uh, there can still be a lot of skeletal issues from mineral problems. So vitamin A is important to keep your osteoblasts going. Right, so vitamin A uh, keeps your, your, your osteoblasts healthy, and there's some vitamin A in our milk, isn't there? Vitamin A and D supplements. Vitamin C is necessary not directly for uh, bone, but indirectly, vitamin C is necessary for normal collagen. And collagen is the protein that makes your bones so strong. So if you don't have enough vitamin C, then you could have soft bones. And there are individuals who are, have this. It's called rickets. Right? And it's not something we see in our country anymore, but because they haven't had enough vitamin C in their diet, their bones are soft and literally are, are softer because of collagen. It's almost like their bones were dipped in acid. Right? They're kind of spongy. They can bend. They have soft bones. And in adults, we call that osteomalacia. So it can happen to adults or to kids, but from a vitamin C problem. Then vitamin D is also very important for our bones. Again, this is why we have it in our milk. Um, Vitamin D is going to help or tell your body to absorb more calcium. And you need that calcium for your bones. So um, if you've got plenty of vitamin D in your diet, it's going to help create more absorption of calcium and phosphorus into your body. Vitamin D is also made by our skin. And many of us are uh, deficient in vitamin D, uh, especially in the winter months when we're not getting very much sun exposure. Women. If you're thinking about being pregnant or pregnant, you want to make sure you're getting plenty of these vitamins in your diet because that baby is forming a skeleton. And it will, that baby's going to win. Right? That baby's skeleton is going to get formed no matter what your nutritional status is. And you're going to be, the, the baby's body is going to be leaching that calcium and leaching that phosphate out of your bones to make its own. So you'll end up with the osteoporotic changes if you're not supplementing carefully during pregnancy. Also, exercise is very important. Mechanical stress, just doing light mechanical stress is required for your bones to keep remodeling. So just doing walking and little bands or exercises is important. So as people get older, right, the most important thing they can do for their overall health is just to stay active and keep moving. And that's true not only for their cardiovascular health, but for their bone health. And so just keep moving, keep some stress on the bones, and that will help them uh, maintain their, their bigger bone mass. If you don't have that mechanical stress, 
the bones will begin to demineralize. That is, there'll be less calcium, less phosphate, and less strength to the bones. There's another thing that's going on in your bones that I want to introduce you to. This is kind of a prelude to what you're going to have more of in Biology 106. You probably figured by now, Biology 105 is a lot of structures. Name that part, name that part, name that part, know that part, know that part. And we tell you enough about how it works to kind of hold the structures together. But in 106, in second semester, we're going to expect you to take all this anatomy that you're learning and apply it to how the systems work. What are the hormones involved? What are the, what's, the, what's really going on at the molecular level? And, and so let me, let me kind of share this story with you right now. You have um, in your body a gland called the parathyroid gland. The thyroid gland is in your throat. The parathyroid glands are kind of behind the thyroid. They're attached to the thyroid gland. And I've already told you that calcium is really, really important for your overall body's functioning. So the parathyroid gland is measuring your blood calcium levels. And when your blood calcium levels go low, the parathyroid gland releases a hormone called parathyroid hormone. Pretty easy. This hormone is going to basically send an alert to your body saying, hey, we don't have enough calcium. We need to increase the amount of calcium. Well, what would you do if you got an alarm, a hormone alarm, saying that you needed more calcium in your blood, what would you do? How would you fix the problem? Say it again. Well, so I want to increase my calcium. So I'm going to tell my osteoclasts to get busy. What are they going to do? Chew away, chew, baby, chew. Right? Remove, re as they chew up the bone, they're releasing calcium, restoring the levels. I'm going to tell my kidneys, don't let it go. Right? Don't let calcium into the urine. Hold on to, or what we call, reabsorb the calcium. I'm going to tell my gut, hey, I need calcium. So whenever calcium comes through the gut, grab it, absorb it, increase the absorption of calcium. And finally, I'm going to tell my skin, hey, get busy, right? I'm going to try to upregulate my amount of vitamin D because that also helps with calcium. So that hormone has all these different effects, right? It goes and tells the body in different ways how to increase the amount of calcium. There's another hormone, and that's what this picture shows. This picture tells us, that uh, when there's low calcium, right, when there's low calcium, I guess white doesn't write on white very well, right? When there's low calcium, PTH is going to be released, and it's going to do everything it can to increase the calcium. So it's going to tell the gut to, you know, absorb more calcium. It's going to tell the kidneys, don't let it flush, stay, keep it in the body. It's going to tell the bones, release more calcium. But there's another hormone that does the opposite. And that other hormone is called calcitonin. And you can barely see that. Calcitonin is released by the thyroid gland, right next door. Right? The thyroid gland in your throat releases calcitonin in response to high calcium. So you get this constant hormonal balancing going on. Now, if you had too much calcium in your blood, calcitonin would be released. And what would your body do in response to too much calcium? Kind of flip it, right? So it's going to tell the osteoclast, hey, we've got, we're doing OK. It's going to tell your osteoblast to do what? Build, right? We've got plenty of calcium around. Let's build some bone. It's going to tell your, your kidneys, let it go, flush it. It's going to tell your gut, we don't need it. When it comes through the gut, we don't need it right now. Let it pass into the feces. And it's also going to tell the skin, we don't need as much right now. So I just want you to realize this little physiological story about PTH and calcitonin and how it is helping to regulate your calcium levels. Anyone ever broken a bone? Okay. Orthopedic surgeons do a great job, right? But really what they're doing is simply trying to get the bones back into their proper anatomic direction, right? Because once bones touch each other, they will, they will reconnect and they will heal usually quite naturally and quite well. Um, unless you have a shattered bone, then you've got some other issues. But if you've just got a nice clean break of a bone and that, those two fragments are put close to each other, they'll find each other, they'll grab on, they'll remake a bone, they, they come back very, very nicely. 
Now, if you've ever been to a third world country and you've seen people who have had some sort of trauma and they didn't have the medical facilities that we have and the bones weren't reset, you'll see some really unusual bone healings, right, where the bones are very, you know, grossly deformed because they healed improperly. But basically, when you, when you cut a bone, you know there's a lot of blood going through a bone. So the first thing you're going to do is get a clot, what's called a hematoma, a big clot of blood. And then those osteoclasts that are already in there are going to come along and start chewing up all the debris and all the dead material and get rid of all that bloody clot. And then those osteoblasts that are already sitting there in the periosteum are going to start activating and rebuilding the bone. The first kind of bone that they're going to build is going to be bo a spongy bone. And then that spongy bone will harden into compact bone. So here's just kind of a picture of this. So at first, right, right there's going to be a big bloody hematoma. Osteoclasts are going to come in, choo, 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 clean it up. And around the outside, those osteoblasts will start building up the outside of it. And what they're first going to build will be spongy bone. And then eventually that'll be uh, converted into compact bone. And the bone will be just perfect, right? The medullary cavity will be reestablished. There won't be anything really different. The x-ray will show a little bit of a, of, a, of a shadow, what we call a collar, that would show evidence of a previous break. But the bone functionally will be in very, very good shape. We'll, I'll show you some x-rays of some other kinds of fractures on Thursday. But I just want you to be thinking about that bone does a beautiful job of fixing itself. Last thing, I told you that bone is changing throughout your lifespan, and there are three different kinds of deformities which are rather common in the thoracic vertebra, right? In your, in your, not, your not in your thoracic vertebra, but all of your vertebra, your spinal column. And these are kyphosis, lordosis, and scoliosis. I'll start with the bottom one. It's the most common. You probably have heard about it. You may know someone with, has a, who has significant scoliosis. Scoliosis would be an abnormal lateral curvature of the spinal column, right? The, the vertebra have, have pushed over to the side. And maybe many of you have been screened for this, right? You, maybe in gym class, uh, the school nurse or the PE teacher had you line up against the wall, lift up your shirt, they walk down the row. If they saw that you had a funky you know, spine, they might have handed you a piece of paper and said, here, you know, today we screened for scoliosis and we think your kid may have a little bit of, of, of signs of it, please have it checked out. You may have been through that kind of screening. I'll show you a picture in a moment. There's also lordosis. Lordosis is exaggerated lumbar curvature, usually caused by pregnancy or obesity. And then there's kyphosis, which is a thoracic a hunchback sort of appearance. So looking at these three, um, on the right, here's your scoliosis. It is this uh, lateral uh, deformity. And you can see the curvature here, okay? So that's scoliosis. It can be even more you know, dramatic than that or a little bit less. Uh, here's your lordosis. It's going to be caused by pregnancy or obesity, pulling on those lower lumbar vertebra. And that can pinch off some of the nerves and cause pain down the leg sometimes. And then there's kyphosis, which is an over-exaggeration of the thoracic vertebra. And this can get really significant, right, where the person's almost hunched over completely looking at the ground all the time. So those changes are gradual, right? They're, they're gradual changes that can occur. And I just wanted you to point out those three different types of uh, changes. Now, this should say, I'm, I'm off by one, you know, this should say chapter seven. So on Connect, or on Mastering, you're going to see um, homework. It's going to hit six slash seven. Six slash seven is bones, right? It's the bone story I just told you. And chapter seven is name that bone. I'm not going to lecture on name that bone. We've already done bones in lab. So it's kind of a combination. Um, and as you're looking at, as you're scanning through chapter seven, though, do make sure that you know what a condyle is, what, that you know what a tuberosity is, or a trochanter, or an epicondyle, or a meatus. Because as you're looking at these bone markings, these words tell you what it is, right? Is it a tube? Is it a roughened surface? Is it something that sticks out? So make sure you are familiar with these terms as you're studying for the, this test as well as for the bone markings. That brings us to the end of this chapter. On Thursday, I'll be discussing joints. Uh, we'll be looking at the articulations and some different joint spaces. I might get started on muscle a little bit on Thursday, and if not, 
The muscle story will be over next Tuesday, and our exam will only be over today's bones, Thursday's joints, and next Tuesday's muscle discussion. So come see me if you have any concerns, and make sure you go by and look at your exam if you have a chance.